I'm just hoping that Ron does email or text or whatever you do these days my wife that I didn't wear my cowboy hat on stage. <clears throat> when I left the house today, she made me promise that part of it. I was really happy when Becky told me that it was casual. I don't know if she understood what casual means to me. <laughs> uh, tough act to follow, sir, what's his name? I mean, that, that's a tough act to follow. Tough act to follow with these guys because it's a, it really is an evolutionary picture of what's, what's going on with engineering education in this region. And I want to say something about this right away. I mean, Ron, you, you, you guys talk about engineering. I'm going to talk about engineering. That's not the point exactly. Uh, there's pro How many people in here are engineers? Yeah, right. We're always in a distinct minority. You, you guys don't count. We, <laughs> we're always in a distinct minority. So if, if all that we do is talk about engineering, if that's what you think I'm doing, uh, it's going to fall on deaf ears pretty much. This is really talking about what these guys are talking about. It's a different way of doing education. And trust me, I've been talking to liberal arts people for 30 years to try to get them to buy this model uh, with limited success. Uh, I think the place for this to start, and what, what has already started with ICC and with Iron Range Engineering, I think the place to start was engineering because maybe it was a little easier for us. Uh, we're used to thinking about how to solve a problem. And I think often engineers are not content to say, oh, well, that's the way we've always done it. Uh, so there, it may have been easier to start with us, but that's not where it should end. Let me give you a quick idea of the evolution of this idea, and it's going to be real quick. First thing that I discovered 30-some years ago, I guess, was, and this was a revolution to me, and it is to most people coming out of the university system, and that means almost all teachers, is that community colleges aren't miniature universities. This is not mini-U. We're not a mini-U because we have a different clientele. The sons and daughters of doctors, dentists, lawyers, school teachers, preachers, and so on, don't usually go to community colleges. Why? Well, because they sit around the supper table at night and their parents direct them. They talk about a career in chemistry. They talk about a career in business. They say, hey, I went to the University of Minnesota. Business school there is real good. The kid gets directed, man. For 18 years, the kid gets, gets direction. And that's all good. I'm not knocking it. But that's not our clientele. 70% of our kids come in with no parent in their immediate family, or no immediate family member, whoever got a four-year college degree. 70%. You saw, saw that in that one slide up there, where what is it, 28% or something of the people in this region have college degrees. So 70% of our kids come from a family with no college degree in their immediate family. 98% of our kids, I can guarantee you that, come from a family that has no immediate person in science like chemistry or physics or astrophysics or engineering or anything like that. So it is different. It is not the son and daughter of a doctor, dentist, lawyer, engineer sitting around the supper table at night. The other thing that's different, and this is true of any community college anywhere in the state, about 70%, 75% of the kids in that community college, when you look back out over the class, are sitting there on Pell Financial Aid. And that means that they aren't the top of the economic middle class. And that means we have to do a different job with these people. It is not many you. We learned that. We started doing something like lab-centered instruction. Ron morphed it into project-based learning, good stuff. We started recruiting, like you would recruit athletes. Not to ICC, exactly, but to the profession of engineering. What was it about? What could you do? We often told, Ron and I would recruit together, and we often told a class of kids, how would you know if you want to go into engineering? And our, question, our answer was, well, if you set in a couple of the engineering classes, like math or physics or one of the beginning engineering classes, and you like those people that you were sitting with more than you like the people sitting in your poetry class, you might be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> we, learned, we formed a learning community. Uh, the Sir guy, he's dead on. Engineering, any kind, it should be, again, liberal arts, it doesn't matter. Teaching, learning, shouldn't be on some kind of fast food model. He's right. What we did to get around that was form a community of learners. Ron and I didn't know what to call it the first time we saw someone else talking about it. We said, oh, yeah, that's a learning community. That's what we're doing. Well, let me tell you, it worked. I was going to wear these, but I couldn't figure out a way to take them on and off, you know, with the mic on. This is approximately from 1993. Boy, you can tell, you know, I'm a child of the 60s, 
<clears throat> That's pro approximately from 1993 when Ron and I started teaching full-time, more or less, together. We had about, at that time, oh, 15 or 16 students at ICC in the engineering program. And this is, if I remember right, from about 1997 when Ron moved back over to ICC full-time. By that time, we had about 40 engineering students in the engineering program. This one is from roughly when I retired in, in 2000. And in 2000, we had about 80 students in the ICC engineering. 80 students in a college of, at that time, fewer than 1,000. Whoa! Currently, that engineering program has about 160 students in it. It's like the fifth or sixth largest engineering program in the state of Minnesota in a community college of 1,200 students. We did something right. Well, that's not the point. The, the point is, is that the evolution of this idea, begun in 1982 or something, the evolution of that idea, which is paying off now at Ron and, and, and Ayer's uh, Iron Range Engineering thing, is a, is a logical sequence, a logical progression. Not exactly a revolution. Engineers don't think that way. But it was a natural sequence of events that really has improved things. Well, trouble is, I don't think it's as successful as it should be yet. A couple of years ago, Ron and I authored a pro grant proposal of Blandon Foundation uh, f to diversify the engineering program. And I know what you're thinking, and that ain't it. I don't mean skin color, hair type, cheap bones, or any of that stuff. I don't even care, contrary to, well, I think she'd agree with me, actually, the Icelandic woman. I don't even mean whether you run an estrogen or, or, estrogen or testosterone. Don't matter to me. I don't care. What I would like to see in engineering, what I hope is the next part of this evolutionary model, is to bring in a broad, pers a broad spe spectrum of perspectives, a broad spectrum of worldviews. What, and she sort of alluded to that, what you think about the world, how you should interact with it, what you should do and what you should not do, is depends upon the worldview that you bring to it. And I claim, folks, that that's different. For those of us who sit among this audience and say that they're Anishinaabe, for those who sit among the audience and say we're male, those who say they're female, those who say that they're European-based, etc. It's different. It depends upon family history, economic history, cultural history, ethnic history, a whole bunch of stuff. Worldview. Engineering didn't just clone classrooms for 50 years. We cloned people. We cloned people that looked like me, well, sort of, kind of, but also thought like me coming into engineering. And that was a mistake. We got to fix that. The great strength of America has never been the iron on the iron range. It was the people, the Poles, the Italians, the Swedes, the Finns, etc., on the iron range who mined the stuff, who fought the battles with the owners. That was the great strength. It's still the great strength of America. We need to change it. Well, I have an idea. Oh, I got to say one more thing about that. Why would anyone care? Well, over here sits the world of science. It's a world of physics and chemistry and astrophysics and good stuff. I'm all for it. And over here sits the world of people. It's what you and I do. It's the world of people. And there's not a lot of communication between those two. When I did research on comets, I didn't ask a question of what could that do for people, what impact, nah, it didn't have anything to do with it. World of science, world of people. Sitting in between those two is an interface. It's like the gate in a transistor, man, it's an interface. That interface is engineering. It takes the stuff that comes out of basic science and asks the questions of the world of people. What do you want? What could you use? Or what could we sell you? Out of the 1960s technology and astrophysics of trying to find out what's in the interstellar dust and cl uh, uh, gas clouds comes this device. Every one of us walks around, when you, uh, I, everyone drives doing it. I don't understand that. That's why we want to do it, why we need to enlarge the set of perspectives in engineering. Because if you're going to interact science with the world of people, it seems to me you ought to have the, wi the widest cross-section of people available to form the goods, to ask the questions of what should we do, what should we limit, what can we do. That's why it's a good thing to enlarge the set of people in engineering. And one more thing. A year or so ago, I, was, I helped to start a science and math teacher program up at Rainy River Community College, and I'm trying to model it on the ICC engineering model. 
It may be that for groups of people who have historically not chosen STEM careers, it may be that the place to start is with science and math education, to generate a new set of teachers who don't teach the old way, who try to incorporate teaching in, of, of math into a larger view of, of society. It might be wise to try and generate a, a set of teachers who teach math and science who don't assume that the first math class you take has to teach you everything you ever have to know in life about that subject. That's nuts. That's not how we learn. No one in this room ever learned anything about what you're currently doing by the first time you took a class or something in it, learning it all then. You learned it over the next 20 years. We need a kind of pay-as-you-go approach to teaching. Uh, learn as, mu as quick as you can, but not everything at the beginning. We don't need to front end load it so much. And maybe what, that's what the Rainy River Project will be able to do. Uh, so I should be able to cue this. That's the idea. Yep, by golly, it worked. A while back, it'll be on the next slide, some folks did a study of the, uh, uh, asked the simple question of new engineers, in your, in your first job, Keep track, keep a log of what you do. And they did that, I think, four or five years with these people. So new engineers coming out in the workforce. And over here is the percentage of the guy of the people's daily work, face-to-face, -face, informal communication, and so on, on down. And over here is the cumulative addition of all of these numbers. And notice, on this slide, man, there's not one time there where it says math computation, calculation, physics, modeling, simulation, or any of that stuff. The stuff we think engineers do. Ron's dead on about that. That's not what we do in a great part of our careers. Here's the next ones. Now it begins to show up. Calculation, 9.2% it averaged out. Son of a gun. You get all, you get all the way down here, it's almost 100%. They had to throw something in just to make it be 100. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Had that been me, this would have been, you know, like 30%. <laughs> I think I know how to do this. I think I know how to in, have a modern model of incorporating a wider cross-section of people into engineering and science and math teaching. What I'm calling, for one of a better word, is inter Intervention, Incentive, and Achievement, IIA. It's modeled upon what we did at ICC. I don't think you can start by going out into high schools and recruiting people whose families have never been involved in this kind of stuff, bring them into a college and then put them in a math class or science, whatever it is, and expect anyone but a genius to succeed in that. And I've never known a genius in my life. It won't work. It works for your kids and my kids because they were exposed at the dinner table to this and they took the right stuff in high school and they got the right grades. But it doesn't work for other people. I think you've got to intervene in about the 10th grade. After you, I think you have to intervene continuously. You have to be in the kid's face, in a sense, 10th, 11th, and 12th. You have to offer them a set of escalating incentives to complete stuff. And I kept asking myself, what would I have them do? Math? Man, I can't figure any better way to get rid of them than that. Physics? I don't think so. You know, I think what I've got to ask them to do is what was on that slide, it makes up the majority of what engineers do, 68%. That's what I think we can intervene. We can focus it upon sciences. We can have them do communication exercises based on a, a magazine like Science Digest or something or uh, Astronomy Today or whatever. But I think the task we need to intervene on will be that of communication. If we do that, and we do it all the way through, 10th through 12th grade, I think we'll be able to recruit a new set of engineering students and a new set of science and math teaching students, and they will encompass a greater set of perspectives, and they will begin to represent what this country is about. And <laughs> never again will I have to take a homeless student back down to Minneapolis in the middle of the damn winter because he couldn't pass remedial math as coming out of a school system. He will or she will have been exposed to this stuff from 10th grade on and know exactly where he or she has gone. And that's, I think, about, unless I can go on for 50 minutes, where I'll quit. Thank you very much. Thank you.